I know it's only just the second Sunday of Advent, but it is the season of holiday movies. Uh, and just in case you're looking for a recommendation, or even if you're not, I want to tell you about one of my favorite Christmas movies. It's called The Family Stone from the year 2005. And it follows the uh, story of a straight-laced New York City businesswoman played by Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, named Meredith. Now, Meredith uh, has a boyfriend named Everett, who she's going home for the holidays with for the first time uh, to meet his family for the very first time. And from the moment she walks up to the house and into the door, she can do no right. Everything she does is wrong. She makes a fool of herself, she puts her foot in her mouth all the time, and she just doesn't seem to be able to make friends at all with the family. And uh, one of her first um, run-ins with the family, uh, they're a very progressive uh, and also eccentric family, um, and, but she's very proper, and she thinks the proper thing to do is for uh, her to stay in a different room than Everett, which means displacing the youngest sibling from her bedroom. And now she's made a mortal enemy of that younger sister. And so this sister, um, in a, a prank during a game of charades, um, rather unjustly accuses Meredith of uh, being a racist. A racist. Um, I'll leave the details of that to the movie. Uh, and so, mortified, Meredith moves to the local inn, and she then begs her sister to give up her Christmas plans to come and be with her to support her. Uh, during this challenging uh, time with the family stone. And so after all that, Everett's father remarks to uh, Everett's mother, his wife, that Meredith doesn't seem to know herself or trust herself, which means, I'm afraid, that our Everett also may not know himself at all. And that's why I love this movie so much, because along with the holiday schmaltz, slapstick comedy, and painful social commentary, the film lovingly follows these characters' journeys of self-discovery. And it is, in that way, a kind of new birth, just like we celebrate at Christmas time. A new child shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. Today's canticle, which we read in place of the psalm, the song of Zechariah, is a really remarkable text. And to give it more context, I want to review some of its backstory. You might recall that Jesus and John the Baptist, he wasn't the Southern Baptist, he was a baptizer of people, uh, Jesus and John the Baptist are related. And according to some biblical sources, some of the Gospels, they're cousins. Like Jesus, John had a miraculous conception. His parents are Elizabeth and Zachariah. And they were quite old uh, at, uh, for having a child. Uh, the Gospel says they were getting on in years. So the story here is that one day Zachariah was serving in the temple in Jerusalem. He was offering incense in the sanctuary, a privilege usually granted to a priest at this time only once in his entire lifetime. And suddenly an angel appeared to him and said, do not be afraid. Of course, any time an angel says that, maybe you should be afraid of what's going to happen next. The angel says, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you will name him John. In Hebrew, John, or Jehonan, means God has shown favor. The angel then links John's future ministry to the great prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, invoking the prophet Elijah with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, 
this would be quite uh, a thing for any parent to hear, but especially Zachariah, he thought he was well beyond childbearing years. He <coughs> expresses astonishment because after all, he and his wife are getting on in years. How will I know that this is so? He skeptically asks. And the angel, Gabriel, says, he has been sent from God to bring this good news. And since Zechariah does not believe him, there's going to be a price to pay. Zechariah will be mute until uh, John's birth. So then fast forward a little bit. Mary, the future mother of Jesus, also has a miraculous visit from an angel uh, and conceives. She goes to meet her cousin, Elizabeth, who at this point is much farther along in her pregnancy. They're both pregnant at this point. And Elizabeth declares to Mary that blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Just as John would later proclaim that one was coming who was greater than himself, looking toward Jesus, here Elizabeth serves as a prophet to Mary. And then when Elizabeth gives birth, Zechariah still, is still mute. And so he cannot fulfill the father's traditional role of naming the child. And so in his place, his relatives were going to name the baby. But the mother, Elizabeth, says, no, his name is John. God has shown favor. Unfortunately, this time and place, the mother counted for very little in the naming of her child. So they asked Zachariah, who writes, his name is John. And immediately he regains his power of speech and he speaks this prophecy that we read today, the canticle, uh, known as the Song of Zechariah. I'll just read some more of the words. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel. You've come to set your you've come to your people and set them free. You've raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear. In his prophetic song, Zechariah links the whole story of the people of Israel, beginning with Abraham, to the birth of his son, John, and the one who would come after him, the mighty Savior from the house of David. Free to worship him without fear is an allusion to the Exodus, when Moses asked Pharaoh to let the people go out into the wilderness so they could worship their God. Then the line that he would save us from our enemies refers to all those who over the course of history had conquered and oppressed the people of Israel, from slavery in Egypt, the Babylonian exile, to the Roman occupation during the lifetime of Zechariah and Elizabeth. In the midst of all this, John would give people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. And so in the tender compassion of God, the dawn from on high would break upon them to shine on those who dwell in darkness in the shadow of death and guide their feet in the way of peace. So salvation in Zechariah's prophecy, because you see this whole link between the whole story of the people's salvation uh, from, uh, from bondage to freedom, Salvation is not just about being forgiven, as good as that is, or about believing in God, or about the rewards of the afterlife. Salvation is about being set free and made whole. It's about restoring hope to a people who have been pushed around and oppressed for centuries, to be saved from their enemies, to be free, to worship God, and to live in peace. When Zechariah's son, John, grows up to become the Baptist, he proclaims that his is a voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. This all begins with repentance. To repent means to change, to turn from the wrong direction and turn to the correct one. We often think about repentance as turning away from sin, which it is, but what if repentance is also more than that? What if it's about turning 
toward something, turning toward God. And if we, if we understand that and expand our notion of what salvation is, that it's about wholeness and freedom, then to repent and turn to God is about embracing the fullness of the life God intends for us, to be who God created us to be. So I want to go back to my holiday film, The Family Stone. Sarah Jessica Parker's character, Meredith, just can't seem to do anything right. Can't seem to please any of that difficult family. Her potential future in-laws think that she's so difficult because she doesn't know herself or trust herself. And so, like they said, they don't think their son does either. So after making a fool of herself uh, and being accused rather unjustly of being a racist, and then later on, very painfully, rather justly, of being homophobic, she says to her free-spirited uh, boyfriend's brother, um, Ben, I tried and I try, and you can just see her pain. And he breaks in and he says, maybe you should just stop. Just stop. Stop trying. It's exhausting. Just relax. And so you see her physically trying to relax. She's trying to get in the posture of relaxation, squirming a bit, because she just can't do it. And finally she says, I'm not comfortable. And Ben compassionately responds, here's the thing, Meredith. You have a freak flag. You just don't know how to fly it. He meant this is a good thing. Uh, in his eccentric family, they um, embraced the idea of, of, of being a freak, um, being true to yourself, um, no matter what that might mean. And so maybe this advent, maybe repenting and turning toward God, embracing the fullness of the life God created for us, means learning to fly our freak flag, our flag of individuality, our flag of who we are as a unique child of God. Maybe it means stop trying so hard to be someone or something that we're not, and instead embrace who we are, who we are <coughs> ourselves as created in the image of God, created fearfully and wonderfully made. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel, you've come to set your people free. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way. I, I love the film so much because, like I said, it's a story of new births, of new beginnings, of people finding themselves. And so I think this Advent, as we await, the birth of Christ who sets us free. Let's think about the ways in which we need to be set free, the ways in which we need to experience new birth. And so I ask you this morning, how do you need to be set free? How do you need to be born anew? What about the people around you? How do they need to be set free? How do they need to experience new birth? And what will you do to prepare the way? What will you do to help yourself on your path to be true to yourself and to help other people to be free to find their path? Maybe in this season of quiet expectation and hope, we prepare the way by just being, by just being ourselves instead of doing. All around us, there's so much doing, so much busyness of the holiday season. And we in the church very much are also busy in this season. But what if we try to be a little countercultural and instead rest a little bit more than we act? And so maybe we need to, in this Advent season, slow down, take a breath, and trust, and ultimately trust Zechariah's prophecy that in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn of 
from on high shall break upon us. This Advent, as we await the birth of Christ, may we also open pray for new births, new beginnings in our lives, so that we may all be free, free to be the child of God we are created to be. Amen.